I'll tell you about you. <laughs> Nor must you regard this as a takeover. My own editorial interventions will be modest. Crap moved his empty glass about on the table. It was Damien now, was it? He forced himself to come to, this, to a decision. Very well then, Mr. Rees. I agree with some trepidation, I must admit. Excellent. The Welshman took a folded document from his inside pocket and spread it out on the table. I have a contract here for you, for us both to sign. It's just a formality. I hope you have no objection. I will then see to it that the first instalment is paid immediately. Crap read through the single sheet swiftly. It contained nothing different to what had already been discussed. There were two copies, and both men put their signatures on each. Thank you, Mr. Crap. A very successful outcome to our negotiation. Reese stood up and pocketed his copy of the contract with a flourish. The pleasure is mine, said Crap. He watched Reese put on his oil skins and walk out into the rain with a brief salute of farewell. Christ, what had he done? Crap went to the bar and ordered another vodka. The bleeping of the gambling machine caught his attention, and he went over and fed in his small change, winning nothing. He sat down again, the hands of the pub clock it was obviously broken, read high noon. When he was back in the office, he'd have to trawl the internet and see what he could find out about storm protective clothing. <coughs> Two more poems from the little anthology which we have added at the end of the book. All the uh, poets who appear in the, uh, in the novel uh, have poems, more, some, some have more than one, and they are collected in an anthology at the end called That's Life, an anthology of contemporary British and Irish poetry edited by J.J. Moon. <laughs> I'm going to read a poem by Bill Gerard Wright, and this is called The Wigwam of the Baroness. Which is one of those surprises on the internet. We sent it in anonymously, and it keeps winning all these prizes. <laughs> Quite true. <laughs> the wigwam of the Baroness. It was yellow when she bought it, but the crow shit soon put paid to that. Then the crows built their nests in the fork tree roof. The Baroness addressed her lover. Antoine, those crows! Can't you do something? But Antoine was kissing her neck. I like crows, he said. They bring good luck. The Inuit call them spirit creatures. He unbuttoned her blouse. Fact is, I was once a crow myself. <laughs> he buried his face in the warmth of her skin, and she heard his muffled call. A louder call came from above, and she felt the wind of wings. Here's another poem by the Irish poet uh, Barnaby Bryan. There's an island off Donegal called Tory Island, which is a weird place. And um, there's a king of the island who, if you go on a boat to the island, he meets you personally. And he plays an accordion and he's a painter. <clears throat> the day I met the merman, I was on Tory Island. I'd gone there at the invitation of the king, who wanted to paint me lolling in a wreck with blue seaweed in my hair. So I arrived seasick to be marched to the far end of the island beyond the lighthouse and down to the rocks where a juicy wreck waited, still displaying splotches of his erstwhile blue. And asleep in there we found the merman. I can tell you the king was fit for tying, till I pointed out what a fine subject for a portrait 
the merman would be. I don't do portraits, he snapped. Only seascapes. This fellow is a denizen of the sea, was my reply. And indeed he looked like a huge blue salmon with blonde hair. I hopped in beside him, waking him, wondering why the king wished to paint me, as I was hardly a seascape. The merman appraised us both, wagging his tail. He cleared his throat, and sounds flew out of his mouth I'd never heard before. Yet I knew what he was saying. He was advising me to swap my feet and legs for a tail, just like his, as one day I would drown. Then he slithered into the water and swam away. The king threw the seaweed wig at me and bade me put it on. He took out his paints and brush, but before he began, he handed me a hip flask of brandy. After thon scaly blue fellow, I think we deserve a good slug, he said, and his painting hangs in the island hotel. <coughs> we thought we'd finish with one more murder. <coughs> Seems appropriate. Um, I'll just put this in a little bit of context. The murder here is the murder of Bill Gerard Wright, who is the poet who wrote The Wigwam of the Baroness. And he has uh, been spending some time as a poet in residence um, at an, um, a small village on a Welsh lake. And he has just given a reading at the village church, and he meets a Welshman. Robert Rees. Robert Rees, indeed. And Robert Rees and Gerard Wright go back to Robert Rees's hotel and they sit drinking and at some stage of the evening Gerard Wright takes out some marijuana and rolls a spliff and smokes uh, several joints and gets pretty stoned. <coughs> and there is a discussion about the fact that in this, near this Welsh village in the hills there are wild donkeys roaming about. And the discussion turns to how would it be possible to capture one of these donkeys? And would it be perhaps a good idea to, would it be possible to actually get the captured donkey and put it on the island which is out in the lake? That would amaze the villagers when they woke up in the morning, wouldn't it? The kind of thing that people talk about when they get drunk and stoned in the middle of the night. And Robert Reese says, well, I have a motorboat. Um, and I have a, a rope. Why don't we uh, test this theory of yours out? Maybe we could catch a wild donkey and um, tow it out to the island. And Bill Gerard Wright thinks at last the place is waking up. It's been so dead up till now. And also, the <coughs> end of this chapter is seen through the perspective of a crow. A crow watched from a tree as the silhouettes of two men moved quickly up the hill. One of the men was carrying a coil of rope slung across his shoulder. The other was carrying a stick. They approached a small group of donkeys. Some were asleep on their feet, others were lying down. The crow left its branch and circled coin. The first man twirled the rope around his head a few times and flung it in the direction of one of the donkeys. The rope settled round the creature's neck and the man pulled the rope tight. The donkey emitted a terrific hee-haw and the other donkeys woke. From higher up the hill came another answering hee-haw. The second man whacked the lassoed donkey's rump with his stick to set it galloping and the man holding the end of the rope pursued the donkey down the hill. The other man fell to his knees laughing but got up as he realized the other donkeys were advancing towards him, braying and snorting. Then he too turned and ran after the first man. The crow flew high over the road leading down to the lake. The lasso donkey had come to a dead stop and was refusing to budge. The two men were pulling at the rope and shouting at it. The man with the stick hit the donkey on its nose and the animal turned round and kicked him hard so that he fell into a hedge. The donkey then turned and galloped towards the water with the other man running behind, still holding the rope. 